thanks everybody for being here. Um, it's really great to see you all here. My name is Christine and I work in the events department here at the Museum of History and Industry. Um, and these are my colleagues of mine, Nicole from Mohai's Interpretive Services Program and Donna Stringer from Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. And they will be with us behind the scenes this evening, helping answer questions um, and with any technical difficulties or any further technical difficulties that we may have. So we will see them a little bit later. Thank you, Nicole and Donna. Thank you. Yeah. So welcome everyone to um, the Linda Straley Memorial Lecture this evening. I'm not going to delay any further, but I'm going to go ahead and get started and introduce our Executive Director of MOHAI, uh, Mr. Leonard Garfield. Leonard, um, would you like to join us? Okay, thank you, Christine. Fantastic. Good evening. Yeah, we're, we're getting going here. I think I'm predicting it's the fire, the winds, the heat, and the pandemic that's uh, all converged <laughs> today. But thank you everyone for being with us. And it's a great honor to welcome everyone to the first, what will be annual, Linda Straley Memorial Lecture, presented by Grandmothers Against Gun Violence in partnership with the Museum of History and Industry. Tonight, we remember and we honor Linda Straley, the inspiring and beloved co-founder of Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. And in celebrating Linda, we have a very special chance to recognize the power of women to lead change. Before we begin tonight, I do want to take a moment, as we always do at Mohai, whether we gather remotely or in person, to acknowledge that we live on the historic and contemporary lands of the Duwamish people and the Suquamish people and other Coast Salish people. We recognize their forced displacement and we honor their endurance. And I also want to take a moment to note that in this time of protests that has been here in Seattle and across the country, uh, calling attention to police violence towards black people, it's more than ever important to state unequivocally that black lives matter and we need to stand with those who call for justice. 100 years ago, this very summer, Americans were also calling for justice. And it was the largest expansion of democracy in the nation's history. We amended our constitution to ensure that the most basic building block of democracy, the vote, was finally and at last extended to women. Suddenly, millions of American citizens were guaranteed the right to vote. But that singular moment, of course, was preceded by a century of struggle and hard work of successes and setbacks from the Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls to the protests at the very gates of the White House. And here in Washington state, we had our own unique history, enacting women's suffrage way back in the territorial period, then withdrawing it, then granting it again, then withdrawing it again, until finally in 1910, the state legislature and then the state's voters, all of whom were men at the time, strongly voted in favor of women's suffrage in the state of Washington. That was the work of women, not voting, but women making the vote happen. And it was a full 10 years before the national suffrage men amendment was adopted. Washington women led the way and they sh showed the way towards that momentous day in 1920 when the national suffrage amendment was adopted. And as women fought to expand democracy, they also served on the front lines and on the home front of World War I and served in the midst of the greatest pandemic in human history. Times like now, when women emerged as frontline heroes who helped us literally survive and then to thrive in both a safer and a smarter world. And the world of women in leading change grew alongside the expansion of voting. There is no question that the election of the nation's first woman mayor of a major city our very own Bertha Knight Landis here in Seattle with her reformist agenda was a direct consequence of the increasing power of women at the polls. When the 19th Amendment was finally ratified 100 years ago, the celebration was short-lived because suffragists then knew what we know now, that another battle lay ahead. The battle to ensure that women were in fact free to cast their ballots and able to exercise the power that they had theoretically just been granted. Black women, Asian women, Hispanic women were automatically denied the right to vote in most of the United States. Literacy tests, poll taxes, the threat 
and indeed the exercise of violence against women voters made the victory of 1920 incomplete at best. But from the start, women continued to fight and lead for change. In 1923, the Equal Rights Amendment was first introduced in Congress. Yet nearly a century later, those simple words that rights will not be denied or abridged because of sex is still not enshrined in our Constitution. And of course, the right of every citizen to vote freely and without impediment continues to be a challenge across the country in this very election year. Democracy, it seems, is always at a crossroads, but it has also always been worth fighting for. And through that long history, women with and without the vote have broken barriers and led the way, whether as the first graduate of the University of Washington in the 1870s, a very brave young woman named Clara McCarty, or the president of the University of Washington all those years later. Women in our community, like Linda Straley, have been leading in times of change. And it is an honor to recognize that in the first Linda Straley Memorial Lecture. And so it is my pleasure to introduce the University of Washington Librarian Emeritus and a great partner and uh, uh, participant of Grandmothers Without Gun Violence, Jill McKinstry. Jill? Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. It is such an honor and a privilege for me to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, our friend and leader, President Anamari Kause. She is the 33rd president of the University of Washington. And we're especially grateful that Dr. Kause is able to be with us tonight. As we know, she's had a long and busy day. Dr. Kause represents a number of firsts for the university. She's the first woman, the first Latina, and the first LGBTQ person to be appointed as the university's permanent president. That is a lot of firsts. This university is one of the largest public research institutions in the nation, with close to 60,000 students and three campuses. Recently, CNBC ranked it number one among top public universities in providing the best return on investment for students. It is consistently ranked among the best universities in the world for teaching and research. Dr. Kause grew up in Miami after immigrating with her family from Cuba when she was five years old. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Psychology from the University of Miami and a PhD in Child's Clinical and Community Psychology from Yale University. She has been on the UW faculty for more than three decades serving as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and as Provost before being appointed president. Dr. Kause played a key role in establishing the Husky Promise. It's a program that has helped more than 40,000 low-income students attend the university. Early on, Dr. Kause launched the university's Race and Equity Initiative, working to ensure that UW and public higher education remain accessible and affordable for all students. It is the university's mission to serve the public good by focusing on the UW's impact on the lives of the people in Washington and throughout the world. In 2016, President Kause brought together the university community and others to create Population Health, a groundbreaking initiative to advance the health of people around the world by fostering interdisciplinary collaboration at the UW and beyond. The vision healthy people, healthy planet, particularly poignant right now. People may ask, what is Dr. Kause like as a leader? To my mind and to many others, Dr. Kause is one of the most talented and gifted university presidents in the country. At the university, I worked under six other presidents. Dr. Kause stands out for her openness, honesty, and willingness to engage. There is never a false note. She senses the pain and discomfort in the community and addresses it directly, engaging in refreshingly honest and open conversations. As you might imagine, faculty, staff, and students can be a tough audience. They are not shy about making their voices heard. She keeps her sense of humor and is famous for her doodles as she patiently listens and listens and listens. She's a talented artist and a wonderful photographer. 
It won't surprise you to know that Dr. Kelsey appears most comfortable in her husky face mask and purple sweatshirt. She is the right leader for the right job at the right time. Please join me in welcoming President Anamari Kelsey. Thank you so much, Jill. I always feel after an introduction like that, I should probably just, you know, fade away because uh, I can't, I can't meet up to it. But thank you, thank you so much, and thank you all for taking the time to be here tonight and for inviting me to speak with you for a while. Um, it's an incredible honor for me. Of course, I wish we could all be there in person and, you know, enjoy the camaraderie. I love Mohai. What a beautiful place. Um, but you know this 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 will have to do for the moment. Um, you know we you know it's you know as we mark you know one thing I'd want us to begin by thinking about as we mark the centennial of the passage of the 19th Amendment, granting all women in the United States the right to vote. I want us to think a minute of how brief a century really is. Um, it may seem like a long time, but when you think about it. There are women who are voting this year who were actually born before the right to vote was guaranteed. Uh, looked at in geological terms, 100 years is not very long. It's the span of a lifetime. And in that span of a lifetime, women have gone from casting their first ballots to being on the ballot at almost every, every level. But it's important to, to, to realize that women's impact didn't begin when they got the right to vote. That's just one important chapter in the story of women's role in advancing societal change. And today that story is constantly expanding as we learn more about the voices and faces that have been erased for too long. It's telling, for example, that the first woman to serve in Congress, Jeanette Rankin, was actually elected four years before the 19th Amendment passed. And I am super proud to note that Rankin was attending the University of Washington when she first got involved in the suffrage movement. So she was actually instrumental in passing the 19th Amendment. And she said, I want to be remembered as the only woman who ever voted to give women the right to vote. That's so amazing. She's the only woman who ever voted um, because she was in Congress to give women the right to vote. She was truly a bold, visionary woman who said of women, we're half the people, we should be half the Congress. Well, right now, we have 100 Congresswomen, but that's just under 25%. So we have another 100 and some to go. And let's make sure that this time it doesn't take 100 years to get there. Our nation's history has always advanced unevenly, and it rarely follows a straight line or a simple line. And it's often retold in ways that leave out important voices. I like to think of it, as they said, I'm a child clinical psychologist, and uh, a lot of times, you know, those of you, you know, you've seen these growth curves that show you how women, uh, how, not women, how children grow. And it's always this very smooth line. But in fact, no child grows that way. Um, many of you have children and you know, one year they grow three inches, another year they grow none. Um, progress, you know, when we look back at it, it always seems like this smooth line. But in fact, that's not the way it happens. And our nation's history has always advanced uneven, unevenly. Um, again, rarely following that straight line. And many of our history's most influential and inspiring leaders also left complicated and conflicting legacies. So for example, the framers of our constitution conceived a nation in liberty while they enslaved people. And white suffragists advanced women's rights, but they often ignored and in fact, sometimes they sacrificed black women's progress to do it. Things do not happen smoothly. It's been said that women, it's been said that history is written by the victors. One job, one very important job of higher education is to interrogate, analyze, and critique in order so that we can develop a more thorough understanding of our history and include multiple perspectives, 
not just those of the victors. And to do this important work of understanding our past and crafting our future, colleges and universities have to become more welcoming and supportive communities for students of all backgrounds. Colleges are heirs of a monastic institution. When they were started, they never conceived of women scholars. Not that long ago, they were still catering almost exclusively to white men, and not only white men, but men who were primarily heirs of wealthy families. I did my graduate work at Yale. I did my undergraduate work at University of Miami. Cuban parents would not let their daughter leave home. But when it came to graduate school, I said, I'm leaving home. And um, I was lucky enough, uh, they only had so many um, residence halls, so many rooms in the residence hall for graduate students. And I won the lottery and I had a room at the Yale. Um, it was called the Hall of Graduate Studies. What was interesting about those rooms is that they had two people sharing, you know, two people with a bathroom in between. But what was interesting is that one of the rooms was actually quite large. It had a window seat that looked up over the courtyard. It had a little fireplace. And the other room was much smaller and very bare. Um, and, you know, you paid more for one room than the other. Uh, and, you know, one, you know, it was just really weird. And so one day I asked about that. Well, the reason why the rooms were set up that way is that originally it was white men who had the big room and they had their valet in the smaller room. And today we talk about how today's students are coddled. Just think about the way it was not that long ago. Now, a lot has changed in college campuses since students went to college with their valets. Um, not least of all is the fact that I, an immigrant Latina lesbian woman, lived in that dorm room. And actually, the lottery gave me the larger room. Um, but again, that was 40 years ago. And I think that a lot of what I hear students today talking about is how much, from their perspective, progress has stalled since that time. We had the first women going to college. We had the first people of color going to colleges. But progress hasn't been anywhere near as quick or as swift as I would have thought it would have been at that time. And universities have a lot of work left to do before we can really say that we are fertile ground for leaders who represent the whole spectrum of society. And, uh, you know, one of the real barriers is that, you know, if you ask people to close their eyes and think about a leader, they don't, they think about, they have an image in their head of what leaders look, sound, and behave like. And guess what? It's not me. Um, whenever I'm featured, my demographics are always featured very prominently when I'm described. And that's partly because I'm not a university president from Central Casting. My niece, who is a screenwriter, she's a graduate, proud English major graduate of UW, if she was writing a story about a university president, um, I'm not sure I'd be who would come to mind. I would be certainly counter casting in any case. But what we need to do is we need to aim for a world where demographics are no longer shorthand for leadership and where my or anyone else's gender, ethnicity, and sexuality are not even worth mentioning. Um, and we have a long way to go be before that's the case. But beyond just the simple demographics, because these things are related, it's important to leave room and space for different cultural styles. Um, for example, when I was coming up through the ranks, um, when I first applied, in fact, for an administrative position, the president at the time told me that I had lots of talents, but that I lacked the temperament for leadership, um, by which I think he meant I tend to be kind of a little bit on the loud side. I'm actually the quietest person in my family, but, you know, compared to this more Nordic environment, I'm a bit louder. Uh, as you can tell, I speak with my hands. 
In fact, one of the tricks that I've learned is if I really want to listen, like um, Jill said that I, I can be good at, I actually sit on my hands. And when you see me sitting on my hands, it's because I'm trying to make sure that I listen and don't talk. Um, so yes, I have a different cultural style. I have a different style of interacting, but it's important to note that there really is no single way for leaders to be, and there isn't one style that's effective in every setting. Um, our vision, or more appropriately, our stereotype of what a leader looks and acts like comes largely from work on leadership that was written after World War II. And at World War II, we had these very obvious, you know, Churchill, Patton, these military and political leaders that had been forged in wartime. Not surprisingly, given wartime, we came to lionize a very command and control style of leadership. And certainly that style of leadership made sense during a war. When you tell soldiers to march, you don't want someone to say, well, let's have a discussion about that. You know, I'm kind of curious, you know, where you want me to go and how did you decide this was the right direction? No, you need someone that will go. But you can imagine, I mean, you know, uh, those of you who are familiar with academics, that style would not go over very well in an academic setting. Um, in fact, a leadership style that's based more on the cultivation of equal, more egalitarian relationships where leaders actually ask for and value the input of others, a style that's sometimes been called authentic leadership, has actually been found to be especially useful in today's flatter and more decentralized organizations. So that command and control that was so good for wartime and that so much still our stereotype of what leaders look like um, may not be a good match for the kinds of organizations that we tend to have today. Um, again, work has shown that in today's more decentralized, flatter organizations where the hierarchy is, you know, less um, hierarchical, this more authentic leadership style has been found to actually work better. And guess what? It's a style that comes quite naturally to women. It's also a style that's more common in non-white men. Yet, women, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Pacific Islander students continue to face systemic barriers that prevent them from accessing the powerful stool, tool of higher education from completing their degrees once they get there and from then entering into leadership positions. Both women and people of color are highly underrepresented in higher education leadership from department chairs all the way up to presidencies. Now right now 35 percent of colleges have women presidents but it's mostly where you see more women presidents are in the very, very important but lesser prestige universities. In fact, there was an article in, um, I think it was the Chronicle of Higher Ed uh, a, a few years ago that featured the top women presidents. And they looked at universities by rankings and these were world rankings. In fact, it was the Times Higher Ed um, that did this. They looked at the rankings of universities, and at that point, I was in the top five in terms of women presidents. Um, there's even less racial diversity. Only 17% of college presidents across all the ranks are people of color. And guess what? It's less than 5% of college presidents that are women of color. So all of us in academia and in every field have a role to play in expanding the definition of who seems like a leader and what leadership looks like. The opportunities to lead and contribute, it's really important that they be open to everyone if we're gonna address the serious problems that we all face together as old and young, 
black, white, Latino, Asian, indigenous, or some combination, as he, she, or they. The challenges ahead of us are incredibly clear and very, very urgent. After all, here we are having to hold the special event via Zoom because there's a pandemic. And, you know, as um, was said at the introduction, this pandemic has really created and revealed um, some of the real fissures that we have in this society, including the economic and racial inequalities um, that exist. In some ways, many of us have seen those before and after pictures um, of places before the pandemic and after. Um, and, you know, before the skies are polluted, afterwards they're very clear and we get to see what was really there all along. And that's what's happened in this country in terms of socioeconomic status and also in terms of race. And in fact, a lot of times people tell me, I can't wait to get back to normal. And I always say, no, let's not get back to normal. What we need is a better normal. What we need to do is to really take this advantage to bring people together. It, it may have taken a pandemic to show us how in fact we carry each other in each other's hands. We are literally in each other's hands. Um, and it is important to really look at leadership broadly. And I don't just mean leadership at the top, but leadership all the way down. Um, I was a leader um, well before um, I was a president, but I led from the margins, and that's important. Peer leadership is important too. So through the great work of organizations like MOHAI and Grandmothers Against Gun Violence, dedicated people are committed to making change, but it will take all of us to make it happen, and that means creating opportunities for all through education. Um, I'm not a Pollyanna. I do not believe that higher education will magically correct all of society's ills, but I can say that none of them can be solved without it. And for that transformation to take place, there must be a recognition of the voices and faces that have been marginalized and erased for so long. In honor of the 19th Amendment's anniversary, I want to mention an American suffragette who is not as famous as her white counterparts. In 1893, a black suffragist, Frances Harper, spoke to the World Congress of Representative Women saying, I do not think the mere extension of the ballot, a panacea for all the ills of our national life. What we need today is not simply more voters, but better voters. Through learning and critical engagement with the world, we honor the achievements of Harper and everyone whose work has changed the world, from expanding suffrage to advancing civil rights to those working today to ensure that black lives matter. Today, we're better able to hear the voices of women and people who have been historically marginalized, but the need for greater amplification remains. As Michelle Obama told the Democratic National Convention, I have seen this country's promise, and thanks to so many who came before me, thanks to their toil and sweat and blood, I've been able to live that promise myself. All of us in higher education and every sector share a responsibility to honor the toil, sweat, and blood of the women who came before us. Together, we can leave a legacy that the next generation of women and men will be proud to carry on. Thank you. Dr. Kasse, thank you so much. My name is Margaret Heldring, and I'm one of the co-founders of Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. I am sure that every person who heard you speak tonight feels as I do right now, because I also see it in the chat box. It was inspiring 
thank you for your perspective on how short a time a century is. I do think that countercasting is good medicine for our society. I think it leads to good things. And I thank you so much for the authentic leadership that you are bringing to the university, to our state, and to the country by your examples. We appreciate it. We know that you maybe are ready to go after a long day, but if you'd like to stay around. I can stay around for a bit. I really do want to. Okay, well, that's really great news. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I am, as I said, Margaret Heldring, one of the co-founders, along with Linda Straley, of Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. And we are gathered this evening for many reasons, many of which Dr. Kausai has so beautifully illuminated. One of them is to introduce you to grandmothers, although I think there are quite a few people on this event, at this event, who are members of Grandmothers, but we are a membership organization that is dedicated to advocacy, to research support, and to education around gun violence prevention and its reduction. We are finishing our, coming up in the end of our eighth year. We have 1,200 members now, most of whom are in Washington state, but we are represented in 31 states. So we know that we have touched something, uh, something about the power and the wisdom and the experience and the generativity of grandmothers. So we encourage you to take a look at us and we would welcome any of you to join us. And we are very grateful to those of you who are members and are so supportive. Linda, as we've said, was a co-founder, but more than a co-founder of grandmothers, she was a beloved wife mother, grandmother, and friend to so many of us on this Zoom. Her quiet, wise, generous ways helped us form, helped us grow, and helped us establish our culture, where I hope the spirit that Dr. Kause talked about, the leadership across all, peer leadership, has really been expressed. We, we miss Linda very much, and we are very thrilled to be able to remember her this evening. And speaking of Linda Straley, it is now my pleasure to introduce members of her family who are with us this evening. Her husband, Hugh, her sons, Nick Straley and Ben Straley. And I think I saw in the chat box other members of the family, a daughter-in-law or two, a granddaughter or more. So let me turn it over to the Straley family. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you, Margie. Um, I'm Hugh Straley and I was a very lucky man because I lived more than 53 years with uh, Linda. We had uh, two wonderful sons, Nick and Ben, who will have um, some very short remarks, they reminded me. Uh, but I need to say that Linda lived a full and a good life. At the All Women Smith College, her life changed. She said it changed forever because there she experienced how empowered women lead and make change. In fact, she learned how uniquely positioned women are to lead and to make a difference. As one of the co-founders of Grandmothers Against Fun Gun Violence, she lived the mantra of stand up, speak up, and show up. And as a grandmother, she knew that she and all grandmothers will do anything to protect and nurture their grandchildren. Uh, all of you know how powerful your grandmothers are and how you listen very carefully and follow whatever they uh, instruct. <laughs> Linda would be extremely humbled by the recognition of this lecture in her name always thinking of others, she would say that, well, there are so many other deserving women engaged in this hard work to eliminate gun violence for all of our children and grandchildren. And, but with all humility, she would also agree with a bumper sticker that I saw recently, any woman who wants to be equal to a man has no ambition. <laughs> this lecture honors a woman who in every part of her life gave love and compassion for her family, her friends and her community. Our family wants to thank grandmothers uh, and Mohai and Dr. Kausi, our inspired and inspiring speaker, who, as she said, is not from central casting, but speaks powerfully and truthfully. And also to all those who contributed to make this important event possible. 
but especially to all of you who work tirelessly to end this insanity of gun violence in America. Please continue to lead and stand up, speak up, show up, so that all of our children and grandchildren will live in a safe and healthy world. Thank you. And maybe Nick wants to say something? Sure, I just, um, I echo what my dad said. Um, it's an incredible honor for, for us and for the memory of my mother to be uh, here with all of you. And I thank you so much, um, Dr. Kelsey, for your words uh, and all of you who helped put this incredible event together. It's a, it's a tremendous honor. And I know uh, my mom would be thrilled and embarrassed. Uh, and I think those are two good things to remember her by. So thank you very much uh, for, for this, this time and coming together like this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, our dad and, and you, Nick, said all that need to be said about uh, our mom, Linda Straley. Um, and thanks again uh, to Grandmothers Against Gun Violence, to Mohai, uh, and to Dr. Kause for uh, such inspiring and enlightening words um, and this meaningful tribute to, uh, to our mom, Linda Straley. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh, Nick, and Ben. And I think I see your grandson in the background there. We are, we are proud of your mother as you are of your grandmother and of your wife. I'd now like to, sorry, Ben, did you want to say? Oh, no, I apologize, Margie. This is uh, Peter Straley, one of Linda's four grandkids. Hello, Peter. Hi. Good that you're here. I would now like to welcome my friend and colleague, Sarah Dean. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Good. So Wonderful. May I, may I invite you to introduce yourself to everyone? Yes, I'm Sarah J.E. Dean, president of the Seattle Section National Council of Negro Women, and I am the outreach coordinator for the Grandmothers Against Gun Violence and I provide administrative support for the Diversity and Partnership Committee, which is chaired by Winona Hollins Haig and Cherie Rowe Proctor. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah. Sarah and I are going to reflect a bit on women and suffrage and race and a number of things, and you'll hear us touch on some points that both Leonard and Dr. Kause have already made, but you know, repetition is the mechanism to learning. So this is, this is a fine thing. On August 18th of this strange and taxing year, we celebrated the centennial of some women to vote. Not all women were affirmed that right. It took 72 years from the Seneca Falls Convention in 1948 to that hot August night in 1920 when Tennessee put the ratification of the 19th Amendment over the top. The movement had seen its share of protests, parades, fiery speeches, passion, legislative lobbying, and political drama. And these, of course, are the same actions and same sights we witness today as grandmothers and other groups work hard to end gun violence in all our communities and to raise awareness and to take action about the racial injustices associated with gun violence. This evening, we are honoring the women, the courageous, strong, persistent women and men who worked so long to secure suffrage. And we recognize that their work, our work, is not done. It is one thing to have the legal right to vote. It is another to have safe, fair access to voting. That's so true. White women gained the right to vote at that time, but the struggle for black women and other women of color is lasting a lot longer. We saw progress with the 1964 Civil Rights Act, but we still face trouble today, and we still need to make good trouble to make sure that these things happen. While major strides have been made, we still have not reached our goal of full and equal voting rights. Here are some of the challenges we face. Gerrymandering, 
voter suppression, lack of polling places, uh, the partisan fight against being able to just mail your ballot in, especially with COVID-19 at this time. And some of those obstacles that we face today are just a little too similar obstacles that we faced in the past, like the poll taxes and literacy tests that were hampering the voting rights of the past. Your points are excellent, Sarah, and it's actually encouraging to see the country wake up to, these, to the presence of these barriers to voting. White women suffragist names are probably well known to many people who are here this evening. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Alice Paul, Carrie Chapman, Kat, and Susan B. Anthony. And think also of the thousands of women and men who marched behind these leaders. We know as well that there were black women and men fighting for suffrage. We have Ida B. Wells, who actually has a school on the campus of the University of Washington, Mary Church Terrell, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Sojourner Truth, and Bertha Pitt Campbell, a young Delta who actually marched in 1913 and relocated to live in Seattle, Washington, and Frederick Douglass, a very outspoken orator who spoke highly for equal rights. We stand on the back of our ancestors, those who marched to ratify the vote, those who helped in any small way live in a nation that was founded on liberty and justice for all. Please turn your attention to a video produced by Katie Hall that helps to make the story complete. Can we stop the video until we can get some sound? Yes, and let's restart it. Thank you, Donna. Who has control of the sound? So I'm sorry, it might have been me. Christine, yeah. Better? No. Not no. better. We can't so, hear. I'm so sorry, I can hear. Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Let me try again. Better? No. Let's move on and perhaps we can go back to the video as a, as a bonus. Yes, okay, sorry about that. Presentation. It is a wonderful video, so I will hope that we will be able to see it. Following this video, Sarah and I would like to introduce, as Dr. Kause did, us to women who not only maybe were at a soapbox fighting for causes or fighting for the ballot, but who have been on the ballot. And as Leonard pointed out, we begin with Washington State that was the fifth state in the United States to give some women the right to vote. And in 1916, now that we know as a University of Washington student 
who became the first woman ever elected to Congress, and she represented Montana. 1924, Cora Bell Reynolds Anderson, the first Native American woman in a state legislature, Michigan. And Bertha Knight Landis in 1926 became the first woman to lead a major American city, and that was Seattle, Washington. 1933, Frances Perkins, the first woman appointed to serve in a presidential cabinet. In 1938, Crystal Drada Bird Fawcett, the first book that was in Pennsylvania. 1949, Margaret Chase Smith, the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate without having been first appointed, Maine. 1966, Constance Baker Motley, the first black woman to serve as a federal judge, appointed by Lyndon Johnson. And in 1969, unbossed and unbought, Shirley Chisholm became the first black woman to serve in the U.S. Congress. She served until 1982 and later ran for president in the Democratic primary. 1990, Patsy Takamoto Mink, the first woman of color and the first woman of Asian Pacific Islander descent in the U.S. House of Representatives. And in 2001, Mary Rose O'Carr, the first Arab American woman elected to Congress in Ohio. And since then, we have seen a growing diversity, a growing election of women and women from diverse backgrounds into the United States Congress. We also wish to acknowledge women like Condoleezza Rice, uh, who served as Secretary of State and Hillary Clinton, and Madeleine Albright, three women who have served as Secretary of State. And bringing us to 2020, we have Kamala Harris. She became the first South Asian and the second Black woman ever elected to the U.S. Senate. And then, she became the first multiracial woman to be selected as a running mate at a major party ticket, the third woman in history ever tapped to run for vice president on a major party. And again, as Leonard said, and now as a point of review for everybody, there are today, or, or maybe it was Dr. Kause, 100 women in the House of Representatives, 25 women in the Senate. And this results together in about 23% in of the U.S. Congress being women. And of those women, 37.8% are women of color. And Mark and I close with this. We are women leading in times of change. In June, we co-authored an op-ed on the police murders of unarmed Black men, women, and youth. We are reminded that our stories and our experiences are different, but even as we have our differences, our work today is shared. In the op-ed, I wrote, to all the grandmothers with black and brown grandsons and granddaughters, we would take your hand if we could and walk with you. And I replied, you do walk with us. We walk together. Grandmothers have powerful voices that need to be heard. Let us raise our voices collectively. We are grandmothers. We show up, we stand up, we speak up, and we're all going to make sure to vote. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ladies. Um, I'm going to announce to those that are still with us uh, that we have a couple of questions I'm going to ask, uh, one for Margie, and is Dr. Fauci still with us? Okay, uh, I have one for Margie and one for Leonard, and I also want to announce that uh, what's going to happen is that Mohai is, go oh, there she is. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. Mm -hmm. Fauci, nice to have you back. Um, uh, what Mohai is going to do is both put the link to the video uh, on, in um, the chat room and we'll also send it to you with uh, a thank you note for attending this evening. So you will have the link 
and we encourage you all to watch it on your own because it's an extraordinary piece of work. So I'm going to start with Dr. Couchy since we have you with us. Thank you so much for staying. And the question that was asked of you is, as a leader in higher education, what we have seen over the last uh, few years is an increasing number of gun events on campuses. As a leader on the University of Washington campus, how do you as a leader think about preparing to either avoid and or respond should such an event happen on your watch? Well, that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting and difficult question because um, some of the things that we're trying to balance, and for those of you that are interested, you might want to go to, uh, if you Google or Bing uh, Anamari Kause blog, you will get the blog that I just put up today, which was my response to the Black Student Union, who had a number of demands, one of them being that they wanted the, uh, the police disarmed and off campus. Um, and so we have this delicate balance of, on the one hand, um, there are real incidences of gun violence that require a police response that have happened at universities across the country. Luckily, we have not had a, we've not had a, um, uh, you know, a, a shooter come onto our campus, but we did. Um, about six years ago, we had someone who shot someone on our campus. It was his um, ex-girlfriend in a domestic dispute. And, you know, we do need to make sure that we have um, the ability to respond to these kinds of events. On the other hand, because of the very, you know, graphic witnessing um, that people have had of watching um, state-sanctioned violence. There's no other way of calling it, you know, uh, police, you know, uh, killing um, unarmed black men, that there is a, um, there is for some of our students, um, and particularly for our students of color and our black students, there is uh, seeing a police officer walk through campus does not make them feel safe, quite the opposite. And so one of the things that we're engaged in is how can we reimagine campus safety? And so what we're working towards, and we're still in the very early stages, and uh, of course there are some people who are upset that we're not just disarming them all now, and there are some people who are afraid of, you know, what happens if they're all disarmed, so what we're trying to do is to better sort out. Um, we have um, armed police responding to all kinds of um, uh, situations that don't require an armed response. If your laptop was stolen from your office, if your bicycle was stolen and the person isn't there, they're already gone, there's no need to have an armed officer come in to take that report. We could send a um, public safety responder. We could have that you could report online. Uh, so we're trying to minimize um, the number of armed police officers that we have and trying to, to, to balance, be, you know, to balance that line. And I'm not sure exactly where it is. This is going to be a work in progress between making sure that we do have a police presence because there are um, some bad people out there with guns. Um, you know, it's very hard to disarm the police when we haven't disarmed the population. Right. Um, but at the same time, I have to be very, very aware of the fact that history has proven to some of our students that police don't keep them safe. And so we're trying to kind of build and reimagine um, what campus safety looks like. And it probably will mean fewer armed police officers, but not zero, and more um, public safety responders that aren't armed. But that's exactly what we're working on right now. Thank you so much. I like that answer, particularly because it acknowledges the complexity of some of these issues. It's not as, it's, they're not simple. No, they're not. And I think everyone, you know, I mean, I always tell my students, if, if you have an, a simple answer to a complicated problem, it's probably wrong. <laughs> right. And that's probably not what they should be learning at the University of Washington. So thank you so much. Um, 
Margie, I'm going to ask you the next question, and it has to do with Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. Um, and the question is, if I join Grandmothers Against Gun Violence, what opportunities will I have to actually contribute or participate in the organization? Well, thank you, Donna. First, I want to just acknowledge my very dark background here. And in this age of technology and Zoom, I seem to have lost a light bulb. <laughs> So, well, at least you didn't lose all of your electricity. <laughs> that's true. So uh, we would welcome anybody, women, men. Uh, we have women who are uh, grandmothers, of course, women who are grandmothers and waiting, women who are grandmothers want to be, women who are not grandmothers, but are primarily of a, let's shall we say, a certain age and very interested in taking on this epidemic this public health ep epidemic of gun violence. So please know everybody is welcome. There are multiple opportunities to get involved. As I said, we have three main pathways. We do advocacy, we support research. I'm proud to say we have supported three significant research projects at the University of Washington School of Public Health that have started to inform public policy. And we also provide a lot of education, believing that an informed activist, an informed person is more comfortable, more likely to take on advocacy and to be effective. We are committed to diversity, to inclusion, to building up our, our membership and our presence and our impact so that we are aware of all communities and how different communities are disproportionately affected by gun violence. So we have our set of co committees. Donna is the co-chair of our membership committee, for example, legislative committee. But we also, we go to Olympia once every year. Uh, we started off uh, about seven years ago when we went on a little school bus. We bumped along for a bit and we've grown up to two buses, two real buses now. We go to Olympia and visit many, many of the legislatures, legislators. And we usually end up at the governor's mansion with the lovely tea with Trudy Inslee, who is a cherished member of Grandmothers. We are also very active in building our presence around Washington State. We're particularly keen on welcoming members from Eastern Washington or parts outside of the Western Washington place. We have um, wanting to build up a advocacy presence and all the districts in Washington State. So just please go to our website. And if you are interested in getting involved, you'll see where you can check that. And you can count on us getting back to you very quickly. If I can just mention something real briefly, because I think it's, it's one of the reasons why I said yes to this immediately. My brother was murdered. He was murdered by the KKK. He was, he was a victim of gun violence. This is important. This touches real people's lives. This is such an important work that you're doing. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. And thank you, you know, thank you for sharing that fact. I'd okay. like to ask Sarah a quick question and then Leonard, you will get my last question. Uh, Sarah, the, you were on a committee uh, for grandmothers that's called diversity and partnership. Yes. Uh, can you can you say a little bit about what that committee does, especially at this time during the racial oh, this discord committee. we have in our community? One of, right. One of the, the main things that we look at is that a lot of the people that are um, getting murdered by um, police, the unarmed people that are getting murdered by police, are mainly Black people and people of color. And so the Diversity and Partnership Committee was formed in order to reach out to other grandmothers and people in our community to try to build a relationship with them, to get a better understanding of things that are going on in all of the different communities, able to be of support to people who have had um, the unfortunate things that happen when you lose someone to gun violence or even if they are shot as in the um, cases that you have where people are paralyzed or sick. And there's quite a lot of that in the Seattle community. So this committee works in order to try to recruit grandmothers of color or people that are interested in this uh, community fight that we're in and people that are interested in being supportive 
to the families and to people who have lost others by gun violence. And I, I want to mention too that today is um, the National Suicide yes. um, yeah. Prevention Day today. And so that's another area. It's not just the, the unarmed people, but it's any type of gun violence that we really are trying to get so that people either have gun responsibility or people learn not to just use their guns in, in ways that are, are harmful. Thank you. I'm going to end with the last question to you, Leonard. And the question is, first of all, let me thank you and Mohai uh, for working with Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. It's been a terrific partnership. I'm sure Margie will have more to say about that before we're finished here. How else does Moha, Mohai expect to uh, explore the history of women's suffrage during this the coming year and, and perhaps beyond? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question because we actually are launching an initiative called Stand Up Seattle, which is all about exploring the tradition and contemporary issues of democracy in our community including the role of women and the voice of women. Um, we've had several programs over the summer leading up to the centennial. Coming up on Saturday, so not tomorrow, but the next day, we will be talking with two of the most influential women involved in electoral, the electoral system, Secretary of State Kim Wyman and King County Election Dr uh, Director Julie Wise, who are going to take a topic that we would have hoped would be innocuous and of little interest, but has turned out to be the center of the controversies this year, voting by mail. So that's this Saturday. Um, and we're excited about that. And there's a whole series of programs coming up. When you come to the museum, when we finally reopen, when health is, is better and we can be back in physical uh, spaces together, you'll see and uh, hear of uh, women and men in our community who are making democracy come alive right now through the women's movement, through the Black Lives Matter movement. So I really do encourage people to visit mohai.org and certainly to visit us when the museum is back open for visitors later this fall. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think we're coming to the end of our program and, and Leonard, maybe you would like to say a few words and then- uh, I'm gonna say a few I'll words, Marky, and then I'm gonna turn to you for the last words. We're gonna kind of work this together here, but I have to say things really quickly. I, I, I hope Dr. Kelsey is still on here. I discovered three amazing historians tonight, Dr. Kelsey, Sarah Dean, and Margaret Heldring. Uh, <laughs> each one of you totally illuminated me, and I, I, I always like to think I know history, and, you only know it if you really listen to the people who make it, like you three. Um, and you did something else that's so important. You named names. Uh, Dr. Kelsey uh, shared the name of Jeanette Rankin. Um, I heard Sarah mention the name of Shirley Chisholm. I think you mentioned the name of a woman I remember from back in the day, Margaret Chase Smith. Uh, what a hero she was. And it's so important that we name these names. And so for you three in particular, but for everyone on the call, I've got 35,000 young people a year who do not know these names and they need to hear these names and the stories behind them and the traditions they uphold and the change that these women led showing us the skills and the leadership that we need today so very desperately. So with that thought in mind, I just want to thank um, everybody at Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. You're an inspiring and remarkable organization, and, um, especially to the Straley family for allowing us to honor your beloved Linda, who has inspired all of us and continues to do so, to President Kelsey, to Sarah Dean, to Margaret Heldreen, to Jill McKinstry, and to Donna for being such a great um, interlocutor and, and is thanking as well our Mohai staff. And I think with that, um, I will say what you said, Margaret, that both Grandmothers Against Gun Violence and Mohai are great organizations. We both have great websites. We'd love for you to become members. Uh, many of us are members of both, and we uh, so appreciate your involvement and support. And thank you again. And so, Margaret, I'll turn it to you for final thoughts. Okay, Leonard, thank you very much. So I actually have two caps on tonight, two hats on. One is, of course, grandmothers. The other is I, I am a former trustee of Bohai. So I would just like to vouch for the excellent, outstanding place Mohai holds in our community. And Mohai, as a history museum, has a commitment to be a catalyst and to help us understand not only our past, but to take a look at what needs our activism today in our present. And this is a real contribution to uh, our city, to our region, and as Leonard said, to young people. And I would like to just say that one of the 
unintended wonderful consequences we've learned as grandmothers, as we've become activists, is our adult children, but also our grandchildren are watching us. And often, more and more often, participating with us in the pre-COVID world when we could go march and stand on corners and wave signs. So it's an intergenerational effort. But I want to commend Mohai. I want to commend the extraordinary staff of Mohai who worked with all of us grandmothers who, let's face it, have various degrees of technological adeptness and helped us put this program together. To Dr. Kausai, to my friend Sarah for illuminating so much for us this evening. To all of you who donated to the Linda Straley Memorial Fund as Linda requested to, to grandmothers through that, you've made you've made a difference, you are making a difference. So be in touch, stand up, show up, speak up, never be shy. Thank you all so much and good And vote. And vote. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to Hugh and Nick and Ben and the grandchildren for being part of this this evening. Good night all. Watch the video, it's great. <laughs>